everyone. It's lovely to see you here. Welcome also if you're watching online. So, a few things in the way of notices. I'm not going to read them all. Uh, there's a lot going on, lots of opportunities, things happening uh, both in this church and also in Hereford itself. So, the friendship group meeting tomorrow night. Please contact Wendy Davidson if you'd like to come to the meal that they're having at the monument. Then, electoral roll. Our annual meeting is coming soon. If you want to uh, vote at our annual meeting, then you need to be on the electoral roll. Uh, please ask Liz for a form if you haven't got one. And if you're already on the electoral form, you don't need to renew your membership or anything like this. This is for new members. But please have a word with Liz if you'd like to join. And you've got until the end of next Sunday uh, to do so. Uh, just a reminder that if you want to come to our Easter Sunday breakfast, we're not charging, but we need to know who's coming in order to provide food. So please let us know if you're coming to the breakfast on Easter Day. Also, on the Saturday before Easter Day, the 8th of April, uh, Ruth would love uh, help, donations of, of greenery and springtime flowers in order to decorate the church for Easter. So please read the notice about that. And I think that's all by way of notices apart from a very important notice, which is, this is our opportunity to say goodbye and thank you to Liz. So Liz, can you come to the front, please? So uh, next week is Liz, Liz's last week as our church administrator. And this should go very well because Liz hates being up the front and I hate saying goodbye. <laughs> so what could possibly go wrong? So Liz, I'm handing you this card and I'm going to read to everyone what, what's said in the card. Dear Liz, words cannot do justice to how we feel about your six years as church administrator. You have gone above and beyond your official duties in so many ways and have been a real example of service to all of us. The caring way you have run things has really been appreciated. Stephen thinks, occasionally he does, no, Stephen thinks that in all his 40 years of ministry, he has not made a better appointment. Love and prayers from all at Homer, Huntington and Grandstand Road. And we're going to give you some flowers, just stay there. <laughs> We're not going to make you give a speech, but as you walk back, we're going to applaud enthusiastically. <laughs> well, we're going to begin our worship now. The singers would like to come up. We're going to stand and sing the song that holds.
take a seat. Well, we might not get a place in their choir, but God loves it when we sing his praises. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So let us show our love for him by confessing our sins in penitence and faith. <clears throat> Be merciful to us, O God, because of your constant love. Because, because of your great mercy, wipe away our sins. Wash away all our evil. Make us clean from our sins. Be first, we recognize our faults. We are always conscious of our sins. Remove our sins and we will be clean. Wash us and we will be whiter than snow. Create pure hearts in us, O God. Put a new and loyal spirit in us. Give us the joy that comes from your salvation. And make us willing to obey you. Then we will teach people your commands. And, and we, we will turn back, back to you. We will gladly proclaim your righteousness. And, and we will praise you. May the God of love bring us back to himself, forgive us our sins, and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <coughs> Well, it's at this point that our Sunday club is out to their groups, either at the back of church or over in the church centre. And as they go, we pray for them. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the children and young people of our church. We pray that they may grow strong in their faith, that they may know you for, your, for themselves and may know the greatness of your love for them. In Jesus' name. And a special prayer for today. Almighty God, you search us and know us. May we rely on you in strength and rest on you in weakness, now and in all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And if you'd like to stay seated as Bradley reads <coughs> God's word to us. This reading is from James, verse 2 to 12. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In any of you lacks wisdom. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wild flower, for the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossom falls and its beauty destroys. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who preserve, perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Now we 
bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, please speak to us through your word today. Strengthen us in our life of faith, we pray. Amen. Well, we're continuing the series on the problem of suffering. And when we come to the letters of the New Testament and look to see what they have to tell us, we come face to face with something that I think seems very alien to us. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete. And it's not just James. This is what 1 Peter chapter 4 says. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trials you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ. And Paul, as you might expect, has something to say about it. In Romans chapter 5 we read, We also rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us. And again in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes, We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. And goes on to say, But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. David Watson in his book, You Are My God, says this, the glib message of, come to Christ and all will be well, or be filled with the Spirit and your problems will be solved, those statements find no echo in the pages of the New Testament. Certainly, God promises us the unsearchable riches of Christ. And the epistles are full of superlatives. Love which surpasses knowledge, peace which passes all understanding, joy inexpressible. But interwoven with these are the darker threads of pain and tears, weakness and sin, suffering and strife. But in the New Testament, a strong message about suffering comes through. It's not saying that Christians are in any sense exempt from suffering, nor is it trying to explain what causes suffering. The message is all about trying to make you and me positive in the midst of suffering. And that positive message is not <coughs> grin and bear it, or even enjoy it. It is saying rejoice in what God can do. We're not being asked to celebrate the fact of pain, but we are being called to celebrate our confidence that in God, suffering can be transformed, that it's an opportunity for growth. The sparkling radiance of a diamond is caused by a lump of coal subjected to extreme pressure and heat for a long period of time. A beautiful pearl emerges when an oyster has to cover an irritating object with layer upon layer of smooth mother of pearl lining. When we suffer in various ways, God is able to use all the pressure and irritation to reveal something of his radiance and beauty in our lives. Well, that's the theory. Does it work in practice? Let me tell you a true story that I think shows that it does. Mary Burgess worked as a medical student, uh, as a med sorry, as a medical resident at Dr. Brown's leprosy hospital in India. One day she went on a picnic outing in a station wagon driven by a young student out to demonstrate his bravery. Overtaking a slow school bus, suddenly saw another car coming head on. He stomped on the brake pedal but hit the accelerator instead. The 
The station wagon veered over a bridge, tumbled down a steep embankment. Mary Burgess, promising young doctor, lay motionless at the bottom of the bank. Her face was slit in a deep gash from cheekbone to chin. Her lower limbs dangled uselessly like two sticks of wood. Mary's next few months were almost unbearable. As summer temperatures reached 110 degrees outside, Mary lay in her slaughtering hospital room in traction, wrapped in a perspex jacket and plastic brace. She faced agonizing hours of therapy, and each week the nurses would test her for sensation, and each week she would, ne she would fail, never feeling the pinpricks on her legs. After observing her downward spiral of despair, Dr. Brown stopped by her room for a visit. Mary, he began, I think it's time to begin thinking about your professional future as a doctor. At first, she thought he was joking, but he went on to suggest that she might bring to other patients unique qualities of sympathy and understanding. She pondered his suggestion a long time, doubting whether she could ever sufficient, recover sufficient use of her limbs to function as a doctor. Gradually, Mary began to work with the leprosy patients. The hospital staff noticed that the patient's self-pity, hopelessness and sullenness seemed to fade when Mary was around. Leprosy patients whispered amongst themselves about the wheelchair doctor, the first in India, who was more disabled than they were, whose face, like theirs, bore scars. Before long, Mary began assisting at surgery, tedious, exhausting work for her in a sitting position. One day, Dr. Brand met Mary rolling her wheelchair between the buildings of the hospital and asked how she was doing. At first, the thread seemed so tangled and broken, she replied. But I'm beginning to think life may have a pattern after all. Mary's cover recovery was to involve many excruciating hours of therapy, as well as major surgery on her spine. She remained incontinent for her life and fought constantly against pressure sores. But she had a glimmer of hope. She had begun to understand that the disability was not a punishment sent by God to entrap her in a life of misery. Rather, it could be transformed into her greatest asset as a doctor. In her wheelchair, with her crooked smile, she had immediate rapport with her patients. Mary stands as an outstanding example of a person who got nowhere asking why a tragedy happened. In a sense, as we saw in our sermons on Job, we must come to the point where we accept God when he says that we can never fully understand the answer in this life. What you need to do, God says, is trust me. And that's what Mary did as she turned towards God and asked to what end she learned to trust him. To trust God to weave a new design for her life. In doing so, Mary has probably achieved far more than she would have had the accident not happened. She showed how God does bring good out of bad. She showed that God comforts us so that we can give comfort to others. She shows that we often find healing in our suffering as we try and bring help to other people. I'd like to give another real life example from the observations of Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist who was sent to a concentration camp. He wrote, We who lived in concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, 
to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. A more light-hearted story. The news was catastrophic. A great flood was going to sweep the earth, just as devastating as the one in time of Noah. And religious leaders from around the world gathered in a symposium to discuss how to approach the crisis. The chairman turned to the Muslim Ayatollah. How are you advising the Islamic people to face this crisis? The Ayatollah nodded seriously. We plan to accept our fate and die stoically, knowing it to be the will of Allah. The chairman asked the Pope to speak on behalf of the world's Catholics. We are planning to pray and trust God to save us, the Pope said. Finally, the chairman invited the chief rabbi to speak. The Jews have lived through crisis like this so many times before, he said resignedly. This time, we are going to learn to live underwater. <laughs> It's that spirit that says somehow God will help us to learn, adapt, and to grow through each situation. That's the spirit that we need. At first, St. Paul could see no benefit of what he called his thorn in the flesh. Hardly able to count it all joy, instead he rejected the affliction. It interfered with his busy ministry schedule. It caused him to question God. Three times he pleaded for a miracle of healing. Three times his request was refused. Finally, he received the lesson that God wanted him to learn through his affliction. My grace is sufficient for you, said the Lord. My power is made perfect in weakness. Christian missionary in China, Mrs. James Hudson Taylor, became blind towards the end of her life. Someone asked her, why should you suffer after all the years of service, doing things for God and for other people? Why should this happen to you? She replied, I suppose God wants to put the finishing touches to my character. Through our experiences in the world, God fashions us. It reminds me of the story of a man who visited the studio of a sculptor. In the middle of the room sat a huge slab of marble. What are you going to sculpt, the man asked. A horse, answered the sculptor. How will you do that, the visitor asked. I'll take a hammer and a chisel and knock off everything that doesn't look like a horse. <laughs> Similarly, God's purpose is to knock off us everything that doesn't look like Jesus. Philip Yancey helpfully gives this analogy. A person's predis predisposition and understanding of pain can dramatically alter his or her experience of it. You will respond quite differently to a sudden blow to the face than will a professional boxer who's paid a huge purse to undergo 15 rounds of pounding. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. And if we fix our eyes on Jesus, maybe our lives will turn out to be like that of the Confederate soldier in the American Civil War who wrote, I asked for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. 
I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything that I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. Two final comments to finish, short comments. Someone once said to a person who was suffering terribly, suffering colours life, doesn't it? Back came the answer, yes. But I propose to choose the colour. Once seen on the side of an ice cream van, often licked, but never beaten. <laughs> Amen. singers would like to come up, we're going to stand and sing, Purify My Heart.
and remember less publicised places of unrest. We ask for help for relief agencies and the earthquake victims in Turkey and Syria, and also those who are suffering as a result of a tornado in Mississippi. We ask for respect for asylum seekers and fair and faster decision making as to their future. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Concerning our own country, Lord, we pray that the pain settlements agreed by much of the NHS will hold, and that the junior doctors will soon receive what is right for them. We bring our pleas to you, asking that the recruitment and vetting of their members be overhauled, so that only those remain who uphold proper standards of law and order. Please comfort victims of crime and their families who feel hopelessly let down. We know that deep down things go wrong when you are insulted and ignored. Please forgive us and revive us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Turning to our own church, we pray for those in the prayer diary for today. And they are Marie and Andrea Spicer Schofield, Meryl Stevens, Matthew and Tasha Stone, Eunice Steed, Sarah and Ian Stevenson, and Wendy Stoner. Father, we ask that you will encourage them in their faith. Help them to remember and trust you in every circumstance. And we pray for the lonely and housebound, that we may respond to their needs when we have opportunity. For those who would love to join us on Sundays but cannot, may they find fellowship through visitors. Bless all home carers. Please cause them to be adequately paid so that more who would enjoy this work will sign up. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Now let's round up our prayers by saying the Lord's own prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. One of the great truths of the New Testament is that we are the body of Christ. In the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Let's then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's offer those around us a sign of God's peace. Okay.
creating safe for our community impact. Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We give the thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. <coughs> and now we give you thanks because for our sins he was lifted high up on the cross that he might draw the whole world to himself and by his suffering and death become the source of eternal salvation for all who put their trust in him. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in the same night that he was betrayed, <coughs> took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. You are the Saviour of the world. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in the one bread. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs on your table, that you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink, in remembrance that he died for you. And feed on him in your hearts, by faith, with thanksgiving. together in prayer. Lord, Lord God, you feed us with the living bread from heaven. 
you renew our faith, increase our hope, and strengthen our love. Teach us to hunger for Christ, who is the true and living bread, and to live by every word that comes from your mouth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Singers like to come up. Our final hymn today is Cornerstone. <laughs>
Christ give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. And as you leave, remember the church magazines, if you get one, uh, are there with your name on if you, if you normally have one. And do join us for a cuppa over in the church centre next door but one. If you want someone to pray with you, then stay behind and make your way to the front here. Have a good week.